everybody, and welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. I am your new host. There's a new sheriff in town, Pat Flynn. Some of you might know me from Philosophy for the People, but I'm helping Swan out here. I'm, I'm very excited for this because we're going to talk about the future of the new Eliakim argument. And uh, I'm mostly going to be throwing the questions out there, and Swan's going to be doing the hard and heavy lifting. But Swan, it's great to be here. Thanks for letting me co-host this episode with you. How are you, my good friend? Oh, I'm doing well, Pat. I'm a, I appreciate you doing this and taking time out of your evening. Oh, well, you know, it's a it's a beautiful evening here in Wisconsin as far as winter evenings go. Uh, and I can think of no better way to spend it than talking with you about the great work and research that you've been doing on the Eliakim argument and the papacy. I know this is something that a lot of people are, are very excited about. It has certainly generated uh, a substantial amount of conversation. So I'm really excited, Swan. I'm excited to hear where what direction you're taking this in. And uh, yeah, it's just cool to be here, my friend. Yeah, I appreciate it, Pat. Yeah. So Swan, let's, let's dive right in. I know the people are excited, as excited as I am. So give us a, give us a brief reintroduction. What have you been doing with this argument? What's new in the world of Swan? And we'll just proceed from there. Well, I'm excited to announce that I have a book contract with Emmaus Road Publishing. This is the same publisher who published Eric Ibarra's book on the papacy. So um, I originally thought the manuscript would be finished by the end of summer, but then I realized that that's a bit too idealistic. Uh, writing a book is a lot more challenging than I realized. And so I viewed kind of this month of February as a trial month to kind of figure out how I'm going to write the book and tackle a routine for this. Um, you know, at the beginning of my month, I had to deal with my grandmother's funeral. I was sick. So just a lot of things were already going wrong. My schedule was already out of whack. And it was a good time to kind of abandon myself to divine providence and realize that maybe I need to go a little bit easier on myself as I'm writing this book. So, you know, please, everyone who's watching, keep me in your prayers as I'm working on putting the new Eliakim argument into its full scholarly print. Yeah, well, first off, I mean, congratulations, Swan. I mean, uh, a, a book deal is a significant uh, accomplishment, and I'm sure it's going to be magnificent with Emmaus. It's like the year of the papacy for Emmaus. This is great. <laughs> first Eric Ibarra and, and now you. Uh, so, yeah, that's awesome. That's that's really that's really cool. And uh, we will very much be looking forward to that swan uh in the meantime let's let's uh let's focus in on the argument so you've been updating this argument what is the updated version of the new alaikum argument and why update it in the first place right let me share my screen so that uh the people can see what the actual updated argument is and i'm going to go to my screen now and uh go full screen from here can you see that still all right pat I can see it, but by the way, uh, gentle listeners in the comments, please give us your feedback. Make sure, let us know that everything is good. And towards the end, time permitting, uh, I believe we want to do some Q&A as well. So if any questions pop into your head, please drop them in the comments and we will tend to them uh, a little bit later. Yeah, looks good here, Swan. All right, so the updated version of the argument starts right off with saying that there's a textual illusion between Isaiah 22, 22, Matthew 16, 19. This is the first phase of the argument. The second phase of the argument then notes that this textual illusion is typological. It sets up this relationship between Peter and Eliakim. Now, it doesn't say anything further about the nature or meaning of the typology. It just says that the relationship is typological. So then the third premise we get, so there is a PET, a Peter Eliakim typology. The fourth premise is the more interesting one. It says, look, if there's a uh, Peter Eliakim typology, then it's prime ministerial. So PET, Peter Lycom typology, is prime ministerial. And then from there in the sixth premise, we say that three and five, that is that there is a Peter Lycom typology and that it's prime ministerial, are much more expected on the hypothesis that the papacy is true than on its negation. And then if three and five are true and much more expected on the papacy hypothesis than its negation, then the textual illusion uh, strongly confirms the papacy hypothesis over its negation. That's a premise. Then the conclusion of all of this is so the textual illusion strongly confirms the papacy hypothesis over its negation. So to just kind of note a few things about uh, this formulation, the big um, advantage, I think, is that it really gets down to what is the Peter Eliakim typology doing? What does it actually mean? Because in the course of the responses to the argument, some people have said, we grant that there's a Peter Eliakim typology, but we reject that it is, if you will, prime ministerial or really getting us to a kind of papal-like status to Peter. 
And so what this argument is saying is, no, we're putting it on the table that the Peter Lykin typology is prime ministerial. Now, of course, Pat, you can see that I have in red um, certain words on the document, and that's because these are key terms. But before I get there, um, I just want to also highlight the fact that my team and I, who have been working on this argument, so Daniel Vecchio, Cameron Bertuzzi, um, Tyler McNabb, uh, uh, we, we've been trying to get Joshua Sijuati involved too, although he's a little busy, and then Father Andrew Dalton. What all of us are trying to emphasize, at least the first three that I named, because they've been more involved, uh, Father Andrew has been very helpful with dealing with other issues. Um, the thing is that, you know, the typology, even though it's between Peter and Eliakim, we need to be careful because the typology is not necessarily between the persons themselves, right? Uh, to give an example, Jesus is the new Moses. Mm -hmm. But technically speaking, the prophecy in Deuteronomy is that a prophet like me. So notice that it's not just a new Moses, right? But it's a new prophet like Moses, right? And so with that qualification that what we're saying is, is that the typology is between uh, Peter and Eliakim's office. Mm -hmm. So to quote from Grant Osborne in his Zondervan exegetical commentary in Matthew, he says, quote, in this sense, Peter here becomes the chief steward of the new kingdom community. And so what we're arguing then is that the typology been between Peter and Eliakim is that both of them receive similar positions within their respective kingdoms. That's an important qualification. It's not just every fact about Eliakim, like for example, Eliakim's father, or as archaeology so shows, grandfather was Hilkiah. Ah, that means that, G, uh, that Peter must have then had a grandfather named Hilkiah. No, that's not what the typology <laughs> is, right? The typology is between their offices or positions within their kingdoms. Mm. That makes sense. It does. It makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Other, I mean, a lot of terminology here, Swan. Uh, are there any other key terms that people need to understand uh, before we move forward with this? Yeah. So as I said before, there's a lot of um, important key terms in this argument. And so let me begin first with um, at least textual illusion. Right. Sure. What is a textual illusion? So one thing to point out is that a textual illusion is not aiming to be a quote. I've noticed that in some of the objections to the textual illusion, um, you know, people have said, for example, um, well, look, uh, look at, let's say, Revelation 3, 7, where you see a lot of words that are repeated. And, you know, only one word isn't repeated in Revelation 3, 7. Uh, that is, the you know, in that passage, Jesus says that he has the key of David. Uh, whatever he opens, none shall shut. Whatever he shuts, none shall open, right? I mean, that's pretty clearly uh, an allusion back to Isaiah 22, 22. The argument is that, well, you know, the allusion in uh, Matthew should be the same, right? And it's like, well, no, an allusion only has to allude. It doesn't need to be a quote, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other thing to point out, too, is that with an allusion, differences are a feature, not a bug, Right. Because a textual illusion isn't aiming to be a quote. That's why it's not a quote. It's doing it's alluding to the source text for a text for a particular reason, but then appropriating what's going on. And so, for example, in my original four hour lecture, I provided examples throughout the New Testament where Jesus would allude to the Old Testament with either an echo or he would um, recite a verse, but he would change the grammar uh, the tense, something in the passage to mm -hmm. suit his purposes. And so, for example, scholars like James Dunn in his book, Univer uh, Unity and Diversity in the New Testament, um, or even what I'm looking at here is Craig L. Blomberg's and others' introduction to biblical interpretation. They all talk about how, you know, uh, to quote it from page 260, Though the, right, the New Testament writers may have borrowed some methods of their Jewish counterparts, they spurned others. That is, the New Testament writers, like Jewish interpreters, appropriated Old Testament texts for their new situations. For example, and they quote another scholar, straightforward identification of one situation or person with another, modification of the text to suit the application, and association of several passages. So the point that I'm making here is that when you see in the Old, New Testament allusions being made, they aren't aiming to be quotes for a particular reason, right? And that's because, you know, whoever is doing the illusion has a particular theology that they want to get across. So they're going to modify and appropriate, you know, what the Old Testament text is doing. And so what I've done with the argument here uh, in my original video was I showed reasonable explanations 
for why, you know, so I provided positive reasons for why there is an illusion between uh, Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. Mm -hmm. And the positive reason is that you see syntactical correspondences where you have a key and a key. You have a uh, God giving uh, these keys to somebody in the Old and the New Testament. You see similar functions being given in both the Old and the New, right? So you see that structure. You see the syntactical correspondences. There are other reasons, too, like thematic coherence and others. Yep. Um, now, on the places where they differ, then, we would need a reasonable explanation for that. So, Pat, let me give you another example. Um, if you imagine uh, the Mona Lisa, right, you have a picture of the Mona Lisa. And then let's say on the other side, you have a cyberpunk Mona Lisa, right? You can I love see, cyberpunk, by the way. Nice. You can see that the cyberpunk Mona Lisa is alluding to and is mimicking, in a way, the original Mona Lisa. But the artist of the second piece is intentionally changing features for a particular purpose, such as they, their preferred aesthetic or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, once again, differences are a feature, not a bug. And if you can show, and it's my job as an exegete to show, that these differences are features, in fact, and not bugs, right? Mm -hmm. They don't count against the illusion, they count in favor. And so other scholars will talk about how differences between illusions these aren't bad things, right? They're expected with illusions because they're not trying to be quotations. Um, and so, you know, I'm aware of Ryan Warner's presentation on Zach Miller's channel against the textual illusion. I've been trying to, uh, you know, Ryan and I have been in contact with each other. The reason why, like, I haven't published a response video right now is because Ryan and I are friends. And I've noticed that when you start trying to have these online back and forth responses, sometimes your friendship can be hurt. You know, because you got thousands of people watching you, you're correcting another person, you know, so I'm trying to lower the stakes. Um, and but I want to say for the audience and people who have asked me to do a response, um, I, I'm not worried at all about the textual illusion from Ryan's presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Ryan provides a lot of good insights. I enjoy talking to him. He's a brother in Christ. Yeah. But um, I, I wasn't convinced by the presentation, respectfully. Well, I mean, that, what you said is actually really prudent, Swan. And I just want to mm -hmm. say um, th there's a lot of wisdom in that, that, you know, when you're making public response videos, and this is one reason why I don't do a lot of public response videos on my mm -hmm. channel, too, is it can generate often a lot more heat than light in certain instances. And just direct private conversation with people tends to not only be more productive, but. Uh, but, you know, friendly as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I just wanted to highlight that because I, I feel like there's just a lot of prudence there. Well, let me say one more quick thing before you go on, because I see that Haley has commented that this is a rebroadcast. Re this is not a rebroadcast. We are live. Pat Flynn yeah. is here right now. This is this is a sequel, not a rebroadcast. I know Swan and I have done this before. So mm -hmm. we are live. And if you guys have uh, questions you want us to answer at the end, please put them in. You're not watching a replay of anything. This is all real time. Okay, Swan, continue. Yep. Right. So another term that's going to be really important in this debate is prime ministerial, right? So what exactly do I mean when I say that the Peter Eliakim typology is prime ministerial? All right. So what I'm going to do is just read out the definition. So prime ministerial means this. One person has received an officially mandated position of administrative authority over the entire kingdom below the king and over the others that continually exists for the kingdom. So in other words, what I'm saying here is that the Peter Eliakim typology has this correspondence, if you will, where they both overlap, is that both Peter and Eliakim, the way in which Peter is like Eliakim based on the typology, is that Peter has officially received a mandated position of administrative authority over the entire kingdom or the church that is below the king but over the other apostles and disciples that continually exists for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So how do I defend? Well, actually, let me just break down too, because there's more terminology in that definition, right? So one person, right? It just means that it's a unique appointment. Only one person at a time is supposed to have it. Now, here's the important part. Officially mandated, right? That is to say that it is constitutionally fixed in character, and not automatically lost or bestowed if someone exercises the same or a similar function. So to give you an example, Pat, suppose that the um, White House press secretary is answering questions on behalf of the president, and then during the middle of this press hearing, the president walks in and begins to talk on the microphone. 
did the press secretary just lose her job because the president is now performing her function? No, because the constant, if you look at the constitution or the nature, the official, you know, demands of the job, right? It's just supposed to be the spokesperson and the president can be his own spokesperson. He can speak on his own behalf, but he delegates that responsibility in that capacity to this individual for a time. But it's not incompatible that she or he has a unique office and the president is able to sometimes enter into that office and exercise its function. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that, for example, during those five minutes when the president walks in and answers a question to the press, the press secretary has lost her job or his job for five minutes. So the important thing here is the constitutional nature of the position. Let me give you another example. So suppose that you have two individuals arguing with each other, right? And one person rebukes the other, and the other person who is rebuked listens and acquiesces to the other person, right? Well, you would think, okay, well, the person who rebuked the other and got the other person to concede their position, the one who conceded has less authority than the one who rebuked. Oh, but now let me put it like this. The person who was doing, who was rebuked was the prime minister of, let's say, you know, uh, of the United Kingdom. And the person who did the rebuking was a lower member of the House of Lords or something like that. Well, then that puts a different spin on it, because at least in their official constitutional capacities, the prime minister has more authority than this person who is lower uh, in, in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But in this kind of associational dynamic, there is a sense in which that lower person did exercise greater authority at this moment. But that doesn't mean that the prime minister is not a prime minister. That doesn't mean that the prime minister's constitutional functions don't accrue and apply to him or her. Mm -hmm. And so this is the other thing that needs to be noted about an official mandate. The position holder is placed under a different standard due to the responsibilities given to him. And this different standard is one of special scrutiny from the king and or kingdom, right? So, for example, we could talk about how, you know, the prime minister is responsible for maintaining the affairs of the kingdom, right? But then so is every local governor with their own jurisdiction. So is every other local official, even right down to the student council and the student, you know, the, the superintendent of the local community, right? All of them have a part to play in maintaining the community. But what you note is that there's a unique special scrutiny on the one who is the prime minister, right? And so what I'm basically saying here is that with respect to Peter, he has this constitutionally given authority that has unique um, responsibilities and expectations under the king. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just go through a few more other things really quick. So administrative authority, right? This means the ability to either instruct or directly oversee the practical affairs of the kingdom, such as forming committees, legislating and enforcing law, negotiating, being the spokesperson, these sorts of things. Now, when I say over the others, the important thing is, is that there are two conditions. There's the asymmetry condition where the official mandate is held by the position holder and not the others, right? So the prime minister uniquely has the official mandate and the others don't, right? The others can um, function and work and do and be in the mission, right, of the prime minister to assist the kingdom, to support it, but they don't have the official appointment or special scrutinized responsibility. The second thing is hierarchy, right? Where the others are under the care of the position holder. So this doesn't mean, for example, that the ones who are below him in the hierarchy can't take care of him, but there's a way in which he is officially expected to be taking care of the others below him, right? Um, and then other things like, for example, the language of continually existing for, right? What this means is that the position serves an important function in the community and is thereby fixed and ongoing, right? So, so long as the kingdom exists, you can know that that office is going to be there as well. Mm -hmm. So how would I go about arguing that Peter has such an authority in the kingdom, that he has this officially mandated position that is above the others? Well, there are several things that I would do, but I think the first thing that I would argue is that Matthew 16, 19 is the closest thing that we have to a constitutional statement on the person of Peter, his official responsibilities and identity. 
So this is part of what I'm writing right now in my book and what I'm arguing for. But um, to put the argument like this, in Matthew 16, 16, you know that Peter gives his confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he says, and I say to you, you are Peter. Now, what scholars like R.T. France, John Noland, and others have noted is that when Jesus is giving that response to Peter, it's reciprocal in nature. It's reciprocal in the sense that Jesus is saying, ah, you have given me a declaration. You have given your confession on who I am. Now I'm going to tell you who you are. I'm going to give my official declaration. And so this is why I think of mm -hmm. all the Petrine Logia or all the Petrine texts that are important for Peter's identity, like Luke 22, John 21, it's Matthew 16 that stands out the most. Right. Because it's because of its proximity to a Christological confession. And then Jesus in the Greek using uh, uh, using uh, you know, the, the Greek language, or at least in the text, to reciprocate what Peter has just said. And so, you know, if people want to know like a particular reason or argument for this, let me pull up actually the chapter of the book so I can uh, cite it more clearly. But Jesus uses a particular Greek word that shows that he's reciprocating what Peter's just said. And I want to also cite um, the scholars here. So let me see if I can pull it up in time. Take all the time you need, Swan. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure that, okay, so maybe I should have prepared this ahead of time. But I uh, let me uh, let me see here. Anyway, um, I can pull that up later, perhaps. That might be better for the audience. But yeah, the, Jesus uses a Greek word. I think it's kago or something like that, where he makes that connection. Okay, and so R.T. France, for example, would argue in his book, The International Critical Commentary on Matthew, that what this shows us is that Jesus is saying, and now I say to you, here's my declaration. You are Peter, right? And so because we have this official mandate, right, we see that something is going on here that is constitutionally fixed and applies to Peter. And so that even the name Peter or Kephas or Rock becomes a title for Peter's role in the community. And that's really important. And then as you go on, you know, various scholars have noted that the authority given to Peter is over the universal church. Right, because Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And then you go to verse 19, where you get the keys of the kingdom and binding and loosing. Right. Um, so you see this relationship uh, of Peter to the universal church as having the keys of the kingdom to have this official capacity. And then I'm going to go on to talk about how Matthew 18, 18 actually secures this interpretation. But I don't want to go on for longer than I should. So um, let me see if there are any other key terms that I need to explain. Oh, the papacy hypothesis. So this is important as well, and I'm actually going to pull it up on my screen. So uh, with the papacy hypothesis, uh, you know, some people, I've noticed that I've needed to, re, uh, to update what the papacy hypothesis actually means because, um, you know, some people are going to say, well, you know, all the apostles had supreme, universal, infallible authority, right? So how can you say Peter alone just had it? And then when I looked at the, the, the documents of the First Vatican Council, I noticed that they, they were emphasizing, you know, unity, the function of unity and keeping the church secure and healthy. And so I realized, okay, my old definition of the papacy hypothesis was inadequate. Mm -hmm. So here's the new definition. For the sake of uniting and strengthening the universal church, Christ singularly established a successional Roman Petrine stewardship or ministry that is supreme and infallible. All right. So the important thing about this new definition of the papacy hypothesis is that it gets you the gist of why, the telos, if you will, sure. of why Jesus gave this particular office. And then it shows you how these other properties fit in. And this is something I want to emphasize, right? Because I think some people think that we say the Pope is supreme and infallible um, and has universal jurisdiction just because we're trying to hype up his authority. Right. right? Mm -hmm. But no, he has those authorities, that that power so that he can unify and strengthen the church. Because if he doesn't have supreme authority and, you know, a council could always overrule his decision, then he can't really unify the church. He doesn't really have that supreme authority. Um, he, obviously, he needs to have universal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. He needs to have immediate jurisdiction, right? That is to say that the authority 
can be immediately exercised without needing an intermediary through which it becomes valid, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the authority, after all, is given to him by the Holy Spirit and not given to him by the consensus of the church. You know, the, the dogmas of the church aren't decided by democratic vote. They're decided by the Holy Spirit through the mechanisms of, of the organs of the magisterium. And then obviously the Pope needs to be infallible or else we can just always say, well, thanks, Mr. Funny Guy in the Pointy Hat, but that's just your opinion, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, I even cite from Vatican I and different places where it actually kind of talks about the um, authority of the Pope. So, for example, in Pastor Eternus chapter 4, paragraph 7 to 9, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But if you notice in paragraph 9, this is where it lays out the ex cathedra authority, right? Um, now, remember, this isn't just the Pope give, being given willy-nilly authority, right, to wield it over the church and to just show how powerful he is, right? Why is he given this authority? Well, if you look at paragraph 7, this gift of truth and never failing faith was therefore divinely conferred on Peter and his successors in this see, so that they might discharge their exalted office for the salvation of all, and so that the whole flock of Christ might be kept away by uh, them from the poisonous food of error and be nourished with the sustenance of heavenly doctrine. Thus, the tendency to schism is removed and the whole church is preserved in unity and resting on its foundation can stand firm against the gates of hell. And I also want to cite from uh, chapter 3, paragraph 5, where it says, uh, where it talks about how the, 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 you know, the Pope is the, if you will, bishop of the universal church. Um, when he's not acting as just the bishop of Rome, but the universal pastor. And in a similar way, right, he's the vicar of Christ on the universal church. But bishops are the vicar of Christ in their local diocese. They have a supreme immediate jurisdiction. So to quote from Vatican I again, this power of the Supreme Pontiff by no means detracts from that ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops who have succeeded to the place of the apostles by appointment of the Holy Spirit tend and govern individually the particular flocks which have been assigned to them. On the contrary, this power of theirs is asserted, supported, and defended by the Supreme and Universal Pastor. So the supremacy and infallibility, universal jurisdiction, immediate efforts of the Pope is supposed to actually help defend the brother bishop. So, for example, if you have a brother bishop who's anathematized, he can run to the bishop of Rome and have the bishop of Rome respond to that council, just as, for example, Pope Leo, uh, Pope Leo the Great had done in responding to the Robert, uh, Robert Council, Ephesus II, to defend a brother bishop who had been anathematized by that council. So the point here is just simply, you know, we can talk about how, uh, you know, we can talk about how other people might have a stewardship in the church. It might be supreme within their respective local diocese and jurisdiction. That's all a possibility. But what I'm saying is, is that for the universal church, Christ has fixed one individual to be that pastor on the universal level. And so, you know, I'm going to get into this more in the presentation but these are just some of the key terms that I want to make clear in the argument. And so before I move on, let me just, um, you know, let me just ensure that, um, you know, people understand what I'm, why I'm going into such great lengths to do this, right? I think the key thing is the reason why it's, it matters that it's prime ministerial is because I'm saying that here in Matthew 16, 19, well, really it's 17 and 19, where Jesus gives his constitutional official statement on the person of Peter. It's Christ's official declaration of Peter, just as Peter gave his official declaration of Christ, right? This is supposed to make sense of all the rest of the data on the identity of Peter in the New Testament. It's a constitutional um, bestowal of authority. It really defines who Peter's identity is, right? And so it's not the case. So really what's going on here is that we're looking to the rest of the New Testament to make sense of this original official appointment given by Christ. Um, to give an example, as I used earlier in another video, if you think about, for example, how God made men the head of the family, the head of marriage, right? You could say, oh, well, I'm looking at these individual examples of how men and women interact, and it looks like women actually have more authority than men, right? And the man's doing everything to please the wife, right? And it's like, yeah, that, that's totally compatible with the divinely appointed headship that God has given to men, right? Right. 
uh, it's not the case that, you know, because if you, let's say, Pat, you agree to what your wife says on a certain decision, you've lost your headship as a man. Always. <laughs> right. You always, you want to keep the boss, you know, and some men will say, want to keep the boss happy and they're referring to their wife, right? That doesn't mean that you've given up or acquiesced the uh, divine headship that God has given you over the family. It just means that you're exercising it with prudence um, in the family. And so, you know, th this is the key question, right? The key question is what are the contents of Peter's official mandate in Matthew 16, 19? It's not even at this point if Peter received an official mandate, but what are the contents of that official mandate and how do they bear out in the New Testament? And so my argument then is that the official mandate is prime ministerial in nature, and it's also... Um, it also has, you know, a hierarchical nature to it. It's supreme. It's unique, and it also endures. It doesn't end, let's say, in Acts twelve seventeen or at the Acts fifteen council. It endures until Peter's death. Awesome, awesome, mm -hmm. very helpful, Swan. Very, very helpful. All right, uh, we need to talk about typology. Obviously, this is a big part of your argument. So, talk to us about that. How do we interpret ty typology? How do we responsibly interpret typology, Swan? Yeah. So the interesting thing is in my four hour lecture, I talked about how, you know, one thing that you want to do is at least find the um, basic kind of essence or similarity between what's going on in the old and the new. Right. So, you know, the thing is, if you can't identify what the parallelism is or why, let's say, Isaiah is being brought up in Matthew. Right. Then the typology becomes vacuous. It becomes, you know, almost, you know, pointless in a way. So we know that if there's a typological connection, it's being done for a purpose. Yeah, and and the the worry here is is typology run amok, right? So we we really want some some principles to guide us on this matter, right? Right. And so you know I've been working on those principles, but I also want to bring up a book that I found. This is Interpreting the Bible by A. Berkeley Mickelson, and what's interesting is that A. Berkeley Mickelson um, laid out some principles for interpreting typology, and um, I believe this is, uh, I believe the author is a woman. Uh, so I don't, I, yeah, I, I think I checked. So she argues, apologies if I misgender anybody, but um, she argues for these basic steps, right, in interpreting a typology. And I want you to notice that it's incredibly similar to what I've done in my own research. So she says, first, note the specific point or por points of correspondence between the type and anti type. These should be examined carefully in the light of the historical context of both. So what was the point of contact between Peter and Eliakim? Well, obviously it's that they received keys and these keys have similar functions. The point of contact between Peter and Eliakim is that they are both chief servants under the king with an official mission and capacities to enact that mission, right? So the theme here is going to be authority. That's the point of contact between Peter and Eliakim. They're both chief stewards. And I also want to mention in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke especially, Jesus mentions stewardship a lot. And the stewardship that he mentions is somebody who is over the house, just as the chief steward in the Old Testament was over the house. Now, I'm not saying that there's a typology there. I'm saying that the presence of a steward theme in Matthew's Gospel corresponds to what we know about what the historical Jesus taught. Jesus always used the image of a steward to talk about what his disciples were supposed to be. So the fact that then Jesus would go into the Old Testament and find a chief steward to distinguish his chief apostle, that makes a lot of sense, actually, given even Jesus' own theology. So um, going on here to the second point, he sa uh, she says, note also the points of difference and contrast between the type and anti-type. This not only develops the historical picture, but also removes the artificialities that are fatal to all true typology. The uncovering of differences, just like with illusions, th that's me adding my commentary there. The uncovering of differences does not minimize the true significance of the point or points of correspondence. Now, the third thing that she mentions is that the New Testament picture of the unity of the people of God should be grasped in its full significance. That is to say that when you are interpreting the nature of this typology, you've noted the point of correspondence, you need to now locate the typology within the overall unity of the Old and the New Testament, with also the unity of God's people in the New Testament, right? You need to put it in its theological perspective. 
So what I'm doing in my book is I'm looking at Jesus's theology of stewardship and authority in the church. And I'm noting that basically my argument is that Jesus gave the papacy not to hype up Peter, right? But in order for the unity and flourishing of his church. In other words, Jesus gave us the papacy because he loves the church and he loves us. And so the point of the steward, as Matthew says in his gospel, as Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, is not to lord over the people like the Gentiles, right? Rather, it is so that the person who serves, who is the leader of all, is the one who serves all, right? That's the image that Jesus has for what a steward is supposed to be. And that's what the papacy, I think, is also supposed to be. And that's not incompatible with it having supreme and infallible jurisdiction, because sometimes a caretaker needs to be able to put their foot down in order to care, in order to protect. Okay, so anyway, she goes on to note um, under 3A, a potential type must show a similarity in some basic quality or element. That sounds like what I said about having a basic similarity in the essence between the type and the anti-type. Then the second thing is the basic quality or element of this potential type should exhibit God's purpose in the historical context of the type and also God's purpose in the historical context of the anti-type, right? So we should see how the correspondence plays in the old and the new. The last thing that she says is that that which is taught by the typological correspondence must also be taught by direct assertion. So that is to say that if we have this typological correspondence, we need something directly taught, right, about, for example, if I'm saying Peter is like a chief steward, like Eliakim, show me where he has authority, like Eliakim. And then that's where you get to verse 19, when you get to the keys and the binding and the loosing, right, that shows you the functions of what's going on there. And that it also add here that when you look at uh, the early chapters of the book of Acts, such as what for an ex uh, cited J.N.D. Kelly's uh, book, uh, The Dictionary of Popes, the Oxford Dictionary of Popes, he notes that in the first 10 chapters of Acts, Peter's the undisputed leader of the early church. And this is actually something that other uh, scholars have recognized, that Peter was the undisputed leader of the early church. He did have this kind of supreme stewardship in the early chapters of Acts. If that's the case, then, then we see by direct assertion, Peter exercising and being that chief steward of representing and taking care of his brothers. So um, that's just to kind of some preliminary notes, right, about procedures for interpreting typology. But I wanted to show that what I'm doing, right, is not kind of just swan inventing it on the spot, but I've actually been able to find then, you know, other scholars who have been able to back up what I'm saying here. Um, now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about are the the steps for interpreting typology. So let me get that out. And I want to distinguish between typologies that are just, if you will, typological interpretation versus like biblical typology. So here's the distinction between biblical typology and typological interpretation. Biblical typology is typology that is taught by the letters of Scripture, right? So the Scriptures themselves— by whatever means, such as, for example, it could just explicitly say, you know, like, for example, uh, Adam is the type of Christ, just as Paul says. Or it could say through a textual allusion by substituting Peter and Eliakim within the syntactical correspondence and structures. That could also be a way of showing that you have a biblical typology. You have the letters of the scriptures saying there's a typology here. You could also have um, now, that, that, so there, there's that. Now, a typological interpretation is one where you look at the things themselves and you just note certain correspondences that the text does not seem to be actually intentionally trying to connect. So, for example, some people talk about a typology between um, Mary Magdalene in the, garden, uh, in the garden outside of the tomb of Jesus and how she's like a new Eve, right? And she's in this garden and she's looking for the new Adam, right, who is Christ. And the new Adam comes, and rather than abandoning Eve in the Old Testament, the new Adam comes to Eve and, and takes care of her, right? So that's a typological interpretation uh, in the spiritual sense, one could say. Um, but the thing is, there's nothing actually, there are no textual features where anything in Genesis is intentionally being called upon and alluded to, right? Mm -hmm. And so that would not be an example. That would be a type, uh, an example of typological interpretation 
but not biblical typology, where the Bible itself is saying there is a typological correspondence here. Now you can go ahead and interpret it. And so I'm saying that the Peter Eliakim typology falls under the former, not the latter. So here are the steps to how to interpret typology, right? The first thing you do is you obtain textual warrant. This is crucial for having a valid biblical typology. And then you confirm that there are typological features. Now, you might be wondering, what are these typological features? Well, if you go back to my previous presentation, the four-hour lecture, I laid out, I believe, five different kind of um, uh, examples of typological features based on my research. And then what you do is you identify the theologically defining point or property of contact. So what is it about the old uh, with the type and the anti-type that connects them together? What's the association? What you know, what resemblance, if anything, what's the bridge that the New Testament author saw to the Old Testament type, right? So it might be with uh, Matthew, Jesus and Moses are both prophets, and that's how you can get things going. Um, they're both prophets who have been, uh, who are the leaders of Israel, right? So you can get into all that sort of thing. And then what you do is you contextualize that property into its biblical paradigm, right? So just as, for example, um, the scholar that I cited here, um, A. Berkeley Mickelson, you know, she talks about how once you find the type, you need to also locate it within the theology of the New Testament. So then what I do is in my book, I'm going to look at where Peter's stewardship fits within the concept of stewardship in the New Testament. And what's interesting about that, Pat, is Jesus, when he, when Jesus like institutes a hierarchy or when Jesus um, gives someone authority, you know, he doesn't typically use juridical language, right? What Jesus, how Jesus speaks is he speaks in terms of care. And, you know, if you, if someone is the superior of another, Jesus isn't going to speak in really strict, rigid, hierarchical terms, right? Because, you know, he's not going to say, for example, that Peter lords over his brothers. Mm -hmm. But he might say something like, Peter is the caretaker of his brothers. And that then reveals a hierarchy. And not only that, but as I said before, you know, the person who's the caretaker, we might think, oh, that's a really soft, gentle position. But no, like a caretaker can assert authority for the sake of care. And that's how you can justify authority and hierarchy, hierarchy in the New Testament. And that's actually profound, actually, in the ethic of Christ. You know, people talk about how Jesus, um, you know, Jesus, as he's in the book, in the Gospel of Matthew, is talking about how the Gentiles, their leaders lord over them. And he says, it's not going to be that way with you. Jesus, in trying to deal with the problem of the legitimacy of authority, what's the justification of authority? His answer is that the justification of authority is care. Mm -hmm. If it is necessary for the good of the community to have this authority, then let it be so, right? But it's meant to serve the community and be for the good of the community, right? So notice that there you can have hierarchy, but it's hierarchy in terms of care for another. Um, there's actually a paper, I believe it's by John Eliot, where he argues that, you know, that, that Jesus was not an egalitarian. And that's, a, you know, that might be profound for some people, but he argues in two separate papers, Jesus is not an egalitarian. He viewed the church as a family. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Greco-Roman and the Second Temple Jewish family, there was a hierarchy in that family. And especially if the master of the house, the father typically, uh, if he was very wealthy, in that family, you would have a steward who is appointed over the house to watch over the kids, right? So to watch over the other servants of the house, right? Mm -hmm. So the point here is that, um, you know, none of what I'm saying so far is incompatible with Jesus' theology of authority. But also because we have Jesus' theology of authority, it's going to show us how Jesus would express hierarchy. If you will, how would Jesus express what Vatican I taught within his theology? That's what I'm trying to get at. Now, um, and now someone might say, well, that's question begging, and that might be a fair objection. So what I want to say then is that, no, but also from Jesus' theology, you can get Vatican I, right? That's the other thing that I want to point to. But anyway, you propose an interpretation or hypothesis of the typological correspondence. You test it against the relevant data of Scripture. You refine your hypothesis as you test it against the data of Scripture. You compare it against other hypotheses. You defend your hypothesis, then you present your conclusion, right? I'm treating this in a very um, scientific way. Mm -hmm. And no, now I, I do want to point out, though, that 
you know, obviously to do exegesis, to do interpretation, it's challenging, right? You know, you got, you have to do a lot of work. Now, the thing that some people will say is, oh, well, it's arbitrary and, oh, you know, and it's like, no, it's not arbitrary, right? You can come up with rules, you can discover principles, you can look at the biblical data. But I mean, the other thing too, is that if you say this is arbitrary, then what's to say that the whole enterprise of biblical interpretation isn't also arbitrary, if that's your objection? Because if that's the case, then I could say, gee, you know, like, you know, to, um, let's say, any Protestant interlocutor I have, yeah, well, that's just your interpretive opinion. You know, what What are your principles? Oh, that seems really arbitrary. This is interpretation run amok. And it's like, well, no, that's not fair, right? You need to look at what is the strength of the interpretation, how plausible are the principles and so I'm hoping here, um, well, and I want to, uh, you know, I, I've been talking a, a while now, Pat, but what's interesting is that there's actually been a lot of consensus that has surprised me on this debate on mm -hmm. the person of Peter in the New Testament. And I'm going to get to that in the end, mm -hmm. but there is consensus. And I think that shows at least that it's not as arbitrary as people think it is. Sure. Yeah, that's great, Swan. Again, very helpful. Uh, I certainly appreciate you being very careful explaining your methodology. I think that's just the sort of thing that's needed in uh, what can otherwise be a very complicated but important debate. So let's get on to objections, Swan. Obviously, uh, there have been a lot of objections that have, have come in. Uh, take us through some of these, if you do not mind, my good sir. Right. So let me just mention some um some bad interpretation, uh, some bad objections. Yeah, we right? love bad objections. So one bad objection is that Eliakim's office is just a minor office. It's not that important, right? This this objection, I mean, there's so many there's so many things wrong with it, right? It would be like saying that Josephus was not a historian in the first century, um, or something like that, um, or it'd be like saying that Caiaphas wasn't the high priest. You know, th these these are really this is a really historically um, misinformed objection. So to cite from John T. Willis, in his book, Instructions Shall Go Forth, Studies in Micah and Isaiah, he says the following, quote, Thus, it signified his extensive authority, that is, of Eliakim, with the keys, in the Judean governmental administration. He was in charge of the royal government offices and royal chambers, and permitted or refused people to go into the king. From the central governmental complex in the royal capital, he exercised supreme authority over the entire country. That's the authority of the chief steward. And as I've had Daniel Vecchio on the show before to talk about the succession from Eliakim, we can see that the uh, successors of Eliakim, those who also held the position of the master of the palace or the one who was over the house or simply the chief steward, they continued to exercise immense authority over the kingdom. So they, you know, they had great socioeconomic status. They were entrusted to watch over the king's possessions. They were perhaps the most trusted servant in the kingdom. Uh, so right, once again, the, uh, the idea that Eliakim's office is not a major office, or, or it's just a minor office, that's a really bad objection. The second bad objection is this. Eliakim's office is not priestly. So I want to distinguish between the claim that it is actually a priest. Like it's actually like Eliakim was actually a priest or a high priest, which is the Jewish reception of Eliakim's office. In the Targums, um, the Jews believed that he had received the keys of the sanctuary, right? Well, that might be a bit of a stretch, but as scholars like Timothy Rucker, the Baptist scholar who I've cited on my channel, who was interviewed, interviewed on my channel, has noted, um, Eliakim had a robe and a sash or a tunic and a girdle, and he also had a turban. And when you combine all of these garments together, they signify that he had some type of connection to the temple. The other thing to point out, too, is that this is also the growing consensus among scholars and that the house of David, remember that Eliakim has the key of the house of David in Isaiah 22, 22. The house of David represents both the palace, the dynasty of David, the legacy of David, but it also represents the house or the temple of God, right? And so the, the when you say the house of David, it can refer to, to both David's palace and David's temple, or in this case, it would be the Solomonic temple, right? So the point there is that Eliakim, well, technically, so Timothy Rucker, the Baptist scholar, he would actually go back and say that Shebna, the reason why Shebna was condemned, 
was because he was neglecting his duties over the temple. But regardless, this chief steward who was over the house, he was over both the temple. He, he managed the temple, you know, checked in with the high priest. He might have not been a priest himself, but he had the garments to show that he had some type of validity of temple jurisdiction. Sure. And he was also over the palace itself. And so, you know, I have, uh, I cited, for example, Anthony Das Prakasam's doctoral thesis, which is cited by, um, uh, which is cited by uh, Timothy Rucker as well in his book on the Temple Keys of Isaiah, where Prakasama also notes uh, that, or Prakasam also notes that Eliakim had authority over the temple and the palace of David. So it was over both. It wasn't one or the other. And just as I've said before, countless times again and again, there was not a neat distinction between church and state, right, in Old Testament Israel. Mm -hmm. And so Eliakim had priestly functions of watching over the temple. And he also had, if you will, I guess, if you want to call it secular temporal functions over the palace, over the kingdom itself. Now, the interesting thing is that David doesn't have a chief steward. And the reason why I believe is this. Under David's administration, you see that the nation of Israel is being built up. It's getting more authority. It's getting more power. It doesn't even have a temple yet until you have the Solomonic temple built. My theory is this, that when it was just David's palace and it was just King David, he managed his own house, right? But once King David, through his son Solomon, built the temple and the house of David became both the house of God and the house of David, right? The temple of God and the house of David, the palace of David, once those both became part of the Davidic legacy, they hired a chief steward who could watch over both of these possessions, right? That's why you see under King Solomon, finally a chief steward is mentioned under his administration. Great. Awesome. Good, good, good. Sorry, I'm trying to keep track of couple different things here at once, but Swan, let's, let's go back to thoughts on the, uh, your thoughts on the textual illusion, specifically what are your thoughts on the objections to the textual illusion now? Yeah. So it's kind of funny because I jumped the gun a little bit, but yeah, we, um, we, we hit it a little bit, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so my basic point is that, um, you know, you know, with a, with a textual illusion, you don't need verbatim correspondence because it's not aiming to be a quote. Right. So for example, um, some people might say, think about this, you know, when I say, Luke, I am your father, right? You know that I'm alluding to, you know, Star Wars, the Empire Strikes Back, right? Um, well, the problem is that that's not a proper quote, right? It's it's not Luke, I'm your father, it's just I am your father, right? He doesn't say Luke beforehand. Some people have said, well, isn't that an example of an illusion, right? And it's like, well, no, that's just a failed quotation, but an illusion is not a failed quotation. It's not aiming to be a quote. It's very consciously choosing not to be a quote, but trying to do enough to ensure that when you read one thing, you, you are reminded of the source text, right? And just as I use the example of the cyberpunk Mona Lisa, and I argued that you can have reasonable explanations for why there isn't verbatim correspondence. Um, and I want to mention, Pat, that I actually found the um, what I wanted to show with respect to the Greek in Matthew's gospel, where it shows that Jesus is giving his corresponding declaration. So I found it in my manuscript. Cool. Finally. So I'll just kind of read here. So the parallelism, and I, you know, this isn't gonna, uh, this, is a, this is a rough draft, so I hope the publisher isn't worried. This isn't the final product. Okay, okay so anyway, uh, the parallelism, oh, so I was right, it was Cago. So the parallelism is enhanced by verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, the conjunctive pronoun kago, uh, kago is not I alone, but I also, or uh, for I for my part, I in turn, which often expresses a reciprocal relation. And then you can read what's on the rest of the page. But R.T. France notes that the Greek phrasing of this declaration, when compared to that of verse 16, conveys reciprocity. And so he translates it as, and I, in my turn, I have a declaration for you. You are Peter right? Just as Jesus, just as Peter said, you are the Christ. And John Nolan down here notes the same parallelism, right? So this is important because in verse, in verses 17 to 19, Jesus is giving his official declaration of the identity of Peter, and it is mimicking how solemn Peter's declaration was. Hmm. And this is why I'm saying that and if you're trying to construct a biblical theology of Peter and figure out his authority, it's really this passage 
that is the groundwork for it. Awesome. Good, good, good. All right, let us move now, Swan, if you don't mind, to your thoughts on the Jesus Eliakim objection. Yeah, so one of the problems is that I've never found this objection convincing at all, right? Um, but there have been people over time who have made a very interesting kind of case for it, you know, or they've uh, kind of, you know, shown me different things about the Isaiah text that I find interesting, right? So I just want to lay out that I've never seen a convincing formulation of this argument because I can actually concede all the exegesis that, for example, some people will say that in Isaiah 22, 22, when it talks about how um, the government will be on the shoulders of Eliakim, that's an allusion to Isaiah 9, where it is said of the Messiah, and then that's applied in the New Testament. I'm totally fine saying that the prospective antitype of Eliakim is Jesus Christ in Revelation 3, 7. I don't mind saying that at all, right? Um, but I would also say that typology does not require that all type antitypes or excuse me, types are prospective or looking forward, right? Mm -hmm. It's possible that the New Testament author could retroactively or retrospectively look back and see a type and connect it to the New Testament. And that's what I see in uh, Matthew 16, 19, when Jesus makes that connection uh, between Peter and Eliakim, a retrospective or retroactive typology, right? So, and, and I, I, I cited Grant Osborne in response to when Gavin Ortland kind of, you know, when he defined typology, Gavin defined typology as a prospective sort of thing. And I'm saying that's good, but that's not necessary, right? It can also be retroactive and retrospective. Mm -hmm. So anyway, somebody might try to argue that, look, the prospective antitype is greater than the retrospective type or antitype, excuse me. Anyway, let me repeat that again. The prospective antitype is greater than the retroactive antitype. And so, for example, the claim would be that Jesus, because he's the prospective antitype, is greater than Peter, who is the uh, retroactive or retrospective antitype. Now, Pat, you and I both believe that Jesus is greater than Peter. I mean, for crying out loud, we, we don't believe, we believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, right? right? He's the representative of Christ. But his office and even Peter's role is ultimately supposed to point back to the greatness of Christ. So there's nothing wrong with that interpretation. We would accept that. The second thing to note is that if you actually accept this principle, then it's problematic. The reason why it's problematic is because in the New Testament, who is, well, actually, when you look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, you know, it's, there's an allusion to how Elijah is the voice in the wilderness who's going to announce the coming of the Lord, right? He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus in the New Testament identifies Elijah as the antitype of, or excuse me, he identifies John the baptizer as the antitype of Elijah. Yeah. Now, you can actually argue that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is also the antitype of Elijah, but he's the retrospective antitype of Elijah. Notice the problem here, Pat. If you say that prospective antitypes are greater than retrospective antitypes, then you're saying that John the baptizer is greater than Jesus. And that's not how it's supposed to work, right? Now, you might say, you know, all sorts of things like, uh, well, well, because, you know, it's Jesus, um, you know, well, anyway, so uh, there are all sorts of ways that one can try to save the objection. But the point that I'm trying to get at is that ultimately what it's doing is it's reading in the Protestant interpretation into a point about Christ. Yeah. So, for example, like it would be the equivalent of, for example, um, you know, if a Protestant were to see Irenaeus speak highly of Scripture, and then they assume that Irenaeus is saying sola scriptura, right? The problem is that just because you have this greatness paradigm, this comparison, it doesn't mean solus Christus now automatically applies. In other words, this objection, so far as I've seen it represented, is just methodological solus Christus. Mm -hmm. Just as, for example, we would crit critique an atheist who does methodological naturalism and just automatically interprets everything within a naturalist lens, and they'll say, for example, well, you see, like, the laws of nature are fairly regular. We don't see miracles on a daily basis. Therefore, that means that naturalism, right, is the best explanation or something like that. And, Pat, you know all about that. For another conversation, but it's a good point, right. Swan. Yeah. And, you know, the last thing, the last thing I'll just say before we move on to some of the meaty stuff Mm -hmm. is, um, look, 
D, I, I've cited this before, but D.A. Carson, in his Expositor's Bible Commentary, the 1984 and the Revised Edition, both times he says it's not a conflict if Jesus has the keys and Peter has the keys. You have to look at the immediate context and see in what way does, G, does Peter have the keys in Matthew and what way does uh, Jesus have the key in Revelation. In Matthew, what I'm arguing is that Jesus, excuse me, Peter has it as the chief steward under the Davidic king. Right. What I'm saying in the book of Revelation is that Jesus has the keys as the apocalyptic eschatological agent of God, right. the royal Messiah, because it says he has the key of the house of David, not the key of the house of David, not the key of the kingdom of David. He has the key of David. Notice the house isn't mentioned. And the reason why is because in John's theology, Jesus's body is the temple. And so John consciously, or Jesus in John's gospel, consciously did not transfer over, if you will, the mention of the house, because Jesus is the house. He is the temple now, right? And so um, the, the keys of Eliakim are used to kind of just emphasize Jesus' supreme authority over life and death, over Hades and the mm -hmm. underworld, right? And so if that's the case then, then we see the jurisdiction, or if you will, what's given to Peter and what's given to Christ, they're distinct. They're not in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And so once again, uh, you know, you would have to really argue for some type of conflict in order to say that somehow Jesus replaced Peter or that somehow Jesus having the keys means that Peter doesn't have the keys. Right. Nobody says, or I, I haven't seen anybody really plausibly argue that this is a zero-sum thing where if Jesus has the keys then Peter can't have it. Right, it's just kind of reading in me uh, methodological solus Christus into the discussion. Sure. All right. The next objection sort of assumes um, it assumes that this isn't a you know a, a competitive thing uh, because we're going to turn to the Matthew eighteen eighteen objection and and by a glance at the comment section, it seems this is the one that most people are interested in. You know, why are we? <clears throat> aren't the powers why assume in other words that the powers are uniquely peter's right and isn't it clear that uh everybody got the keys right uh, everybody everybody has this right uh so yeah aren't all of the apostles supreme and infallible and and all that all that good business swan so please help us uh, help us think through this one mm -hmm. right i think this is the principal objection that needs to be addressed and it's also the one that i've dedicated a lot of time and research into so um let me pull up another PowerPoint presentation. So my old um, four hour lecture PowerPoint, because I think it has some helpful notes. But as yeah, I'm doing that, mm -hmm. as I'm doing that, let me just begin by presenting what I found. The key difference between 1619 and 1818 is the jurisdiction or the scope given in both passages. So in Matthew 1619, when Jesus says, you know, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And then he gives the binding and loosing authority. The church there, my church, it's the universal church. It's the church as a total, complete, unanimous phenomenon. In Matthew 18, 18, the consensus of scholars agree that Jesus is laying down a rule for local churches. So he's giving them basically a halakhic procedure, and then he gives the authority, in this case to the disciples directly, to be, in essence, uh, halakhic enforcers. They can go into local churches and settle disputes and lay down the law, right? They, if you will, can act as local rabbis. So notice what the distinction is. Jesus, uh, Jesus makes Peter the rabbi, the halakhic enforcer of the universal church. In Matthew 18, 18, all the apostles receive the ability to be halakhic for enforcers, to be rabbis in any local congregation. So notice that the authority in both contexts is universal, right? There's no doubt about it, but you would be remiss if you didn't note the distinction and how it's universal. In the latter passage, it's universal in that they can enforce, you know, and they can enforce in any local church the halakha of Christ. Whereas with Peter, he can enforce the halakha of Christ on a universal level, right? And in particular, because we have this image then of Peter as the chief steward, 
it shows that he has this administrative capacity to practically enforce and govern the affairs of the community. Now, where do we see this? We see this in the opening chapters of Acts when Peter rises up from among the apostles and says, we need to form a committee in order to pick the successor of Judas, right? And then you see in Acts chapter 5, Peter in the Jerusalem church speaks on behalf of all the apostles when he lays down the sentence on Ananias and Sapphira. Peter acts as the, you know, uh, the authority over the universal church, and scholars like C.K. Barrett and others recognize. Now, now Barrett does hold to the interpretation that Peter's supremacy eventually ended, but he notes that Peter was the, the leader of the universal church when the universal church was just bound in Jerusalem. At the time, Jerusalem was the universal church in the early Jesus movement. So um, to justify my interpretation that the um, authority given to Peter is implicitly wider, I want to go back to the commentary of W.D. Davies and Dale Allison, because it's in that commentary where they actually argue the point that the church in both passages, Matthew 18, 18 and Matthew 16, 19, are different. Now, I, I want to emphasize, Pat, once again, that both of them have, you know, both the apostles, uh, all the, well, see, okay, so Peter, as the universal rabbi of the church, can command and administrate the entire church on a universal level. That is a hill that I'm willing to die on. That's what I'm saying Peter has that none of the other apostles had. None of the apostles acted as the administrator of the universal church like he did. Hmm. Just as when he decided and rose up from among the apostles and said, we're picking a successor to Judas, mm -hmm. right? Um, whereas all the other apostles, you know, and, and so we're going to get into now the, the immediate objection is going to be, well, all the apostles could write scripture, right? Um, and so Paul, for example, could operate on a universal supreme immediate level because he could write scripture, right? I'll get to that. But first, let me just read um, what W.D. Davies and Dale Allison wrote so that people can see that this isn't just Swan right over here uh, and making up his own interpretation. So here's what W.D. Davies and Dale Allison say. If possession of the keys means the power to bind and loose, then one may urge that Peter is promised no more than the other disciples. For in 1818, the power to bind and loose is clearly held by others. But if verse 19a is broader in scope, then one can make the case for Peter having a unique function, and they cite Vatican II, which is interesting, they're both Protestants. In our estimation, it is most natural to think of verse 19a as being explicated by what follows. To have the keys is to have the power to bind and loose. Further, verse 19a and verses 19b to c probably have to do with teaching authority. We do, however, still insist that Peter is not thereby put on the same level as his fellow disciples. It remains true that only he is explicitly said to have the keys. More significantly, verse 19 cannot be isolated from verses 17 and 18, and in these last, Peter is spoken of in terms not applicable to anyone else. Remember, he's given the name Peter. It's a title that applies to him. Also, it should not be overlooked that whereas 1818 concerns the local community or assembly, 1619 is about the church universal. Hence, the authority bestowed in, in 1619 is implicitly wider than that given in 1818. For these reasons, then, we are not persuaded that the existence of 1818, with its more general promise of the authority to bind and loose, diminishes Peter's prominence. If the power to bind and loose was also given to the others, that does not entail that those others exercised their powers in quite the same way as did Peter, or that they too held the keys of the kingdom, I would add, in the same way as Peter. Right. So I think this is a pretty strong quote to note that, yeah, like the way that you can tell that there's a difference between the two is that one, the jurisdiction is different because you have to look at in what way does Jesus refer to the church in eight in 1619? It's the universal church. It's a top down type of authority. Whereas in verse 18, 18, all the disciples, including Peter and presumably the apostles, have the power to bind and loose in local communities. Now it's universal because for example, um, you know, any, any jurisdiction where the apostle entered into, he would have the supreme immediate authority, right? Because he is uh, the distinctly chosen by Christ to be this enforcer, right? But who could uniquely command the universal church and act as the administrator of the total phenomenon? It would only be Peter. 
as noted in the early chapters of Acts, right? And that's the argument there. Now, let me get into the objection that, okay, well, no, the other apostles had supreme and universal jurisdiction, and so did, um, you know, uh, Paul, for example, because he writes scripture. Well, we also know that Mark and Luke wrote scripture, right? Could we say that they had universal, supreme, infallible jurisdiction? Well, in a way, yes, right? Because they wrote God's inspired words. But notice there that because Mark and Luke have it and they're not apostles, writing scripture is not an official power of an apostle, right? The official power of the apostles, what they were specifically sent out to do, as noted in Matthew 28 and elsewhere, was to go found communities, build them up, and sustain them. That was the mission of the apostles, to get the Jesus movement going, right? Now, Mark and Luke, you could say, have supreme, universal, infallible jurisdiction because they wrote scripture, right? And presumably it would have been recognized as such, um, given you know how it has endured in the tradition of the church and among even Irenaeus saying the four gospels, right? It was recognized as scripture. But we would say that Mark and Luke are different from the apostles, why? Because they weren't administrators in the early church. They didn't operate like the other apostles, despite the fact that they had universal supreme jurisdiction. Their universal supreme infallible jurisdiction was, it was different from how the other apostles could you know, say they had universal supreme jurisdiction. I mean, it's like, for example, saying, Pat, that you and an elephant are the same because you're both animals, right? Like, okay, there, there's a similarity here, but you know, it's too broad, right? And so what I'm saying is that Peter, as with the new papacy hypothesis definition, among the apostles, also has a unique appointment with his binding and loosing authority. And, <clears throat> you know, that's been the point of the presentation to show that it was on a universal level. Right. The last thing I want to say is this. In Jesus's theology, if he's going to institute a hierarchy, remember what I said, it would be a hierarchy based on care. Those who are placed under the care of another, that person has hierarchy in the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. right? Because that's how you justify hierarchy in Jesus' theology. Within a family structure, it's care. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the disciples fall asleep, who does Jesus blame? He blames Peter. He expects Peter to strengthen, guide, and lead his brothers. Now, What's interesting about that, I mean, especially explicitly in Luke 22 and John 21, when, G mm -hmm. when Peter is entrusted to take care of lambs and sheep, right? The lambs and the sheep are of different ages to take care of the flock. Um, and even when Jesus asked the question to Peter in John's gospel, do you love me more than these? The these there should technically be translated as them because Peter's ask Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than the other disciples? He's, it's because Jesus expects more from Peter. And that's exactly one of the conditions of prime ministerial authority, that there is a person who is placed under special scrutiny and is uniquely burdened with care for the others. So yeah. that's how you can get to Peter being prime ministerial. He has a unique expectation from Christ. And I should also add this too, really quick. In the Greco-Roman world, at the end of a steward's tenure, he would be expected to offer a final reckoning or explanation, right, of how he managed the off, the, the master's house and managed the servants. You can actually find records in, in, in Greco-Roman sources of um, bad stewards who had to explain why they spent money on prostitutes, for example, and other things. Um, so in the case of the New Testament, what I'm doing is I'm using this kind of, if you will, um, final reckoning paradigm where i'm asking in the end of the at the end right what was peter uniquely expected to do and i would imagine it's something like this peter would be asked by christ did you unify and protect my church and did you strengthen your brothers and then jesus would ask the brothers though did you you know unify strengthen the church and did you assist peter mm -hmm. in his mission right and it's precisely in that assisting function where you will see a hierarchy where Peter's the one being assisted, because that means that you know um, he's the one being supported. It's his mission, 
that, but then you also get another kind of, uh, but there's a gentleness to this hierarchy and that Peter needs his brothers to help him, to give him the moral support, to be able to fulfill his mission in the kingdom. Jesus, you know, this is the beautiful thing. The papacy is not, uh, you know, the, how do I put it? The papacy is not the Pope just acting alone all the time and him versus the church. That's not the way to view the papacy. The papacy is this idea that Christ has bestowed this great stewardship upon this one man over the universal church, but given his fallible, and so in that way, given his stewardship over the universal church, he points to Christ, but also given his moral limits, his human limits, which he still retains and which we as Catholics still recognize, he has the need of his brother bishops to strengthen him. And mm -hmm. even that in his weakness ultimately points to Christ and our desire for one day, the perfect leader, to see him and to know him. So <clears throat> regardless, the main thing is that the authority in 1818 and 1619 is different. And you can see this borne out in the early chapters of Acts. But also like when, when Paul talks about, I lay down this rule in all the churches. Yeah, he's laying down that rule in all the churches. He's talking about local jurisdictions and bodies that are under his care. I mean, if you notice, for example, even though all the apostles we can say have universal jurisdiction and that they could rule in any local church, you know, some of the disciples, they didn't really, like maybe I think John went to Jerusalem and Ephesus, right? Um, some of the disciples didn't travel all that much. They didn't do as much. James, the apostle James, only stayed in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. right? So there's a way in which you can say they had universal authority, but the thing that really matters is what God expected of them and how God used them in particular. I mean, you know, because, you know, obviously you could say that the authority of Thomas is universal just as the authority of Peter is universal, right? But Thomas went down to India, right? And, and he focused on that diocese and that jurisdiction, right? Whereas Peter went to Antioch, he went to Rome, he went to Jerusalem, he went to all these places. There's a difference there um, that we should recognize. And so maybe the title just universal on its own is not a, a helpful title because there are all ways in which one can have universal jurisdiction, just as I mentioned with Mark and Luke. Okay, those were some very helpful responses, Swan. Thank you. And mm. you brought up James, so why don't we just turn there now? So James in the Council of Jerusalem, and then we got to talk about Paul and Galatians as well. Right. So James is an interesting example because Oscar Kuhlmann, in his ground mark, uh, his his remarkable book, his groundbreaking book, Peter, Disciple, Apostle, Martyr, which was published, I believe, in the the forties, if I recall, and then he had an updated edition published in the fifties or sixties. Kuhlmann, a Protestant New Testament scholar, he gave a very kind of uh, fair assessment on the person of Peter. But what he argued was that Peter had supremacy in the church. You know, he had this leadership capacity, but then it ended by the time he got to Acts twelve seventeen when he hands the Jerusalem church to James, and then James becomes the head of the church after Peter. And so the argument is that by Acts 15 in the Jerusalem council, because James is the one who makes the final decision, that shows you that James is the one who's really the head of the church at this point. So um, I want to note just a difference once again between James and Peter. When, ja when Peter was the head of, the uh, of, of, of Jerusalem, when he was the head of the Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem church was the universal church. When James is the head of the Jerusalem church, he's only the head of the Jerusalem church, and Jerusalem acts as like the headquarters or the mother church of all the other dioceses. So they eventually send out letters at the end um, to other jurisdictions to help give the rule on what the apostolic decree is, right? But that's an important distinction to keep in mind. Um, Peter, uh, excuse me, Jeru uh, Jerusalem becomes the headquarters of the universal church, whereas under Peter, Jerusalem was the universal church. So that is to say that there is a nuance there that needs to be noted, right? Jerusalem is not the universal church under James anymore, but it becomes the headquarters, the center of operations, right? That's important. The other thing I want to keep in mind is that although James held great authority, he was not given the explicit mandate to rule over the church, to care for the brothers and strengthen them like Peter received it, right? And so that would then make the, the, you know, the, the placement, the expectation, if you will, the final reckoning paradigm that I'm using different between James and Peter. 
Because James is going to be asked, if you will, at the end of time by Christ, did you strengthen and unite the Jerusalem church that was under your care? And then Jesus would also ask, did you um, strengthen your other brothers and take care of them? Right? But this expectation of commanding the universal church and protecting it on this universal global scale, that would once again uniquely fall upon Peter's lap um, as the official appointment would have it. So the other, th so that, that's the thing. James' primacy could be conceived of in practical terms, right? James, uh, you know, uh, was recognized as an authority in the early Jerusalem church, probably because he was related to Jesus Christ. And one Jewish scholar actually argued, I think in his book, Paul and the Invention of Christianity, so it's kind of an anti-Christian work, or, or, or a, a work uh, critical of Christianity. Uh, actually, let me pull up who the scholar is. But he argued in that book that, you know, Peter's this chief steward, and James might have held, you know, been given great, uh, given, given great authority in the early church because he was viewed as the royal brother of Jesus. And so it'd be like the continuation of a Davidic dynasty. Um, so that's one possibility. Although the thing is, yeah, let's see here. It's by Himam Makobi. That's what he argues in his book. Now, what I want to say in response, though, is that, um, well, I mean, there are all kinds of ways you can respond, right? Because one is that as Catholics, we don't believe that James was the blood brother of Jesus through the Blessed Mother, you know, because she was perpetually virgin. Um, but even if he was conceived of in royal dynastic terms, James, that's not a divine appointment. Right. That might be an association that you can make like, oh, yeah, James is part of the royal family. Right. And so that means he has, he's really important, just as, you know, Mary would be uh, the royal uh, queen mother. But in terms of who was given the authority to rule and command the church on a universal level and take care of it, that would fall distinctly, explicitly on Peter. Whereas with James, you kind of have to infer it. And but then there are other there are other possibilities, too, like some scholars just believe that James you know, because of the resurrection appearance and um, because, because for example, if you think about it, Pat, Jesus had other brothers and sisters, right? Um, you know, now how he uh, translated Delphoi, Delphos, that's right, a different yeah. matter, mm -hmm. right? But he had other siblings. Jesus specifically chose James. So the royal dynastic interpretation is also flawed because then why don't we see the other brothers and sisters of Jesus having this dynastic status, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain why James in particular rises to the top. It might explain a little bit. But my point anyway is that Peter has the explicit mandate to rule, not James. But James, for practical reasons, because of the importance of Jerusalem, because Peter has to go away in Acts 12, 17 to run from the Roman authorities, he becomes the head of the Jerusalem church, which makes him the head of the headquarters of the universal church, right? But I would say that his authority is one that is practical, whereas Peter's, his primacy is one that's divinely instituted. Sure. Yeah, that's good, Swan. All right, let's touch on uh, St. Paul and Galatians. Yeah, and and really quick, too, um, you know, my article on Catholic Answers, Center Stage on the Big Council, it deals with the objection from Acts 15 in more detail. But another thing I want to note, too, is that as we stated in Vatican I, as we read from Vatican I, the authority of the Pope does not take away from the immediate ordinary authority of the of the bishop in his diocese, mm -hmm. right? And so because James is the bishop of his diocese, because he's the head of the Jerusalem church, there's no reason to believe, right, that Peter and James, you know, because they agree that Peter is going to somehow, you know, uh, push aside James and say, oh, yeah, you know, you know, but let me make the decision, right? No, because they're both in agreement. So they don't need to make it. Peter doesn't have to assert his authority in that context in that way. Now, in the case of Galatians 2, this is an example where Peter basically, as I note in my other Catholic Answers article, he chickens out. Uh, James sends his uh, kind of emissaries down to Antioch. And Peter, um, because Peter, uh, after the Jerusalem Council, given Paul's description in Galatians, was given kind of uh, you know uh, authority over the Jewish believers. His job was to minister to them. Um, you know when you have the emissaries of James, fellow Jews, critiquing you for eating with the Gentiles, and let's say that's your flock, right? That's the flock that you were specially designated to manage by at least the the by the other apostles, right? By this council, Peter is trying to play politics and please the Jews under his care, right? But then Paul rebukes him 
for not manning up basically under the circumstance. But it's interesting because some people will say, well, okay, um, that actually shows you then that uh, Peter doesn't have universal jurisdiction. He only had jurisdiction over the Jewish believers. No, that's not what that means at all, right? What it means is, is that Peter was specifically designated to minister to the Jewish people, right? To reach out to Jewish brothers and sisters, to get them on board with the apostolic mission. So once again, it's a practical decision to say, to have Paul reach out to the Gentiles, to be that PR person, if you will, and to have Peter be the PR person for the Jews. But in this episode in Galatians 2, if you notice, when Peter leaves the scene, Barnabas, who was there at the council beside uh, Paul, also flakes because he's following Peter's example. And then the Jews and the Gentiles who relied upon Peter to be the bridge to bring them together at the table, they split apart. Notice that Peter has a unifying role. And when Peter chickened out and left the table, the unification ended. He wasn't able to be the bridge that he was supposed to be of unifying the church. And so Paul rightly rebukes him. Now, this is something I want to keep in mind. Because some people are going to question, and I think this is probably like the next objection on the roster. Or actually, uh, well, it, it, one could make it so. But there's this question here on how long was Peter the head of the church, right? Oscar Kuhlmann, Moises Silva, other Protestant scholars will argue they'll concede that Peter had immense authority all the way up to Acts 12, 17. And then by then he disappears from the scene. He comes back in Luke's narrative in Acts 15, and then he disappears again, right? And that, I guess th they presume that shows that he didn't have as much authority or something like that, or he lost, or he, he was the rock, the foundational rock for only a period of time. And then eventually he becomes a rock in legacy or memory, but not an active function, right? What I want to acknowledge is that Peter doesn't act as the head in quite the same way as he does in the opening chapters of Acts, right? I want to acknowledge that because at this point, you're having the further institutionalization of the church. You're having more leaders instituted. Peter doesn't have to micromanage and do everything now, right? Because other people have been put in charge. But that doesn't diminish the official appointment that he has. It doesn't diminish the authority that he received. And in particular, remember the final reckoning paradigm that I had. The final reckoning paradigm, what is specifically uniquely expected of Peter, and my argument is that it's the expectation that Christ has for Peter is prime ministerial in nature, right? That he would, on a universal level, strengthen and protect the church. When Paul calls Peter Kephas, so notice that in the, in the early parts, when Paul is talking about in the Apostolic Council, the Jerusalem Council, how he and Peter receive unique responsibilities, right? He calls Peter, Peter, but then he switches to Kephas when he talks about the situation in Antioch. My hypothesis is that when he's talking about the Gentile mission, Paul refers to Simon as Peter because it's Greek. But then when Paul is trying to make a point to his Jewish brothers and sisters, he's going to use the Aramaic because that's kind of like, if you will, um, when people are talking amongst each other in the same culture. Right, they'll they'll kind of use the familiar terms like your, your Hispanic friends, right? <laughs> when they're around, um, you know, me and other and other people who aren't Hispanic, they'll just usually talk in English, right? Whereas when they're with their uncles, their aunts, they talk in Spanish, right? They use the low their the, their native tongue. So then Paul switches to Kephas, and it's interesting because Kephas there, remember that's what Jesus originally called Peter in Aramaic, you are rock, and on this rock I'll build my church. I think what Paul's doing there is he's going back to the Matthew 16, 18 event, and he's saying, Simon, you were called to be rock. Be the rock. Live up to what your title and your calling is. So in other words, Paul is using Kephas there to remind Peter, you're still responsible for this. That responsibility that Christ gave you, that never left. You're responsible not just for, for founding and building up the church in the early days. You need to sustain the legacy that you built. You need to man up and get the job done. You're not off with work yet, right? And the thing is, you know, if we're going to also say that Matthew 18, 18 and Matthew 16, 19 are related to each other, you know, why, why is it that in Matthew 16, 19, Peter's binding and loosing um, ends during his lifetime, 
but the apostles binding and loosing doesn't end during their lifetime. Yeah. That seems mm -hmm. like you're playing a double standard there. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, if they are so connected, then let me say that if Peter's binding and loosing ended during his lifetime, then it ended during the apostles lifetime, but no, no, everybody recognizes that that's an absurd argument. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the apostles continued to have that authority. And so the same with Peter, he continued to be responsible for the universal church. Originally he began as if you will, the, um, almost like founder in a way, you know, he had that kind of immediate building up authority. He was trying to get the apostles banded together. He was mm -hmm. preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, uh, settling the issue on, you know, can Gentiles be part of the church? That was part of his early days of the ministry. Okay. And then it switches from doing that immediate micromanaging to then sustaining the legacy, the unity, the foundation that he's built, right? right? And I mean, for example, if Peter is the foundation rock of the church, the foundation is there at the beginning of the building's existence, and it continues to sustain the building. And so even giving the, given the metaphor of a rock, Peter's role is ongoing, mm -hmm. right? He continues to have to maintain the legacy of unity and strengthening that was given to him. And so really, Pat, when Jesus, excuse me, when Paul, um, actually, I would say it's Jesus through Paul, right? When Jesus through Paul calls Peter, Simon, Kephas, he's saying, remember what Jesus said to you in Matthew 16, 18. Remember what he said to you at Caesarea Philippi. You need to be the rock. You need to be the foundation. And that's the beauty. I mean, I, you know, so Galatians 2 is often used as a disproof of the papacy, but I think it actually shows you that Peter never lost his role as rock. Mm -hmm. It was something that was constantly being used on him to get him to man up and do the job. And what was the job? To be that chief steward, that prime ministerial figure. Yeah, tremendous, Swan. And that leads uh, nicely into the next and really final major thing we want to cover tonight and that is succession so let's talk about that how how, how are you arguing for succession these days mm -hmm. right so um you know i might bleed into the next question which is also what surprised me in my research yeah but basically um what surprised me in my research is that the strongest and best scholars well I, I, what i perceive to be the strongest and some of the best scholars like moisa silva oscar kuhlman um and others what they acknowledge is that Peter really did hold a kind of supreme monarchical leadership over the early church. What they'll say is it ended in Acts 12, 17 and Acts 15, right? Um, that Peter was this foundation, this rock for the earliest days of the church, right? And, and he continues to be that rock, if you will, based on his legacy of what he did in the early church. They don't see the rock as something that's ongoing. Um, now, there are other Protestant scholars who are going to say, no, that's hogwash, like Mar Martin Hengel, who thinks, no, Peter remained very important, the rock man, until the day that he died. Um, but what I found fascinating was that a lot of scholars agree, right, that with the, with the things that I'm claiming about Peter, the thing that they dispute is the tenure. How long was he head of the church? How long was he, you know, acting in this uh, universal, rabbin, uh, as the universal rabbi of the church? The second thing that they're disputing is whether or not there was successors, right? So what I would do to defend succession and the tenure of Peter is first, aside from my Galatians argument for the tenure of Peter being ongoing until the day he died, because as long as he had that name, you could also use it as a way to club him over the head and say, hey, do your function, you know, do your job, your rock. Um, Jesus gave that to you for a reason. To get to succession, what I would do is I first begin with an argument from intuition and then build up to an a priori argument. So all of us intuitively recognize that Peter's job of uniting and strengthening the universal church, that's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's something worth doing. And in fact, I've known some Protestants who will say, oh, we're all given the keys, right? It's all of our job to unite and strengthen the universal church. I mean, I mean, good, right? That's a kind of succession, at least at minimum, that you're acknowledging that Peter's office or the mission continues to go on. Um, even uh, Marcus Bachmuel in his book, uh, Peter in, in uh, was it Peter in Scripture and Living Memory, something along those lines, he recognizes too that all of us recognize that there's something about Peter's mission that is ongoing and applicable to you know other Christians. I think um, Kuhlman is a kind of, I think he's Lutheran or something. He, he cites that maybe 
uh, the bishops right have this responsibility, which would fit nicely with an orthodox paradigm. But regardless, everybody recognized intuitively the ministry continues. So then we get, get we can get to a priori arguments now, like Joshua Sijuati's argument for why we would need this kind of office. It serves an essential function uh, to cross, you know, cultural barriers to make sure that propositional revelation is actually meaningfully received, and it continues. We would need it to continue through succession, right? Uh, and Rob Coons is a priori argument that to meaningfully uh, to will the end is to meaningfully will the means. If you're going to pursue something like the unity of the church, like that it should remain one and strengthened, then you have to institute the objective institutions and structures that are going to allow you to do that, right? Or else you're going to end up having just schools of thought that are separated into their own interpretations. You need infallibility in order to unite the church, unless you have a more kind of loose, mere Christianity kind of unity, right? Which, I mean, that would be the debate then on what is the nature of unity in the early church. But when the early church talks about being of one mind, when the early church talks about how it was able to coordinate, sit down at the table together and come to a universal decision, Mm -hmm. I mean, in what sense do we as Christians within our, like, you know, you know, Pat, um, you know, you know, in a family, if you are really one, when you have arguments, you sit down at the table, you work on them together, and then you leave with a universal conclusion. You work it out as a family or else what happens is, you know, the brother, the sister, the son, the daughter, they run off, they start their own family, they go away. Right. They don't talk to mom and dad anymore. Yeah. And that's how, you know, you have a schism, mm -hmm. right? When you have that inability to come back to the table and work together and come to a conclusion with one another. Right. Right. And so that's, you know, one way in which you can show that um, the family is the model of unity for Christ in the early mm -hmm. church. But anyway, mm -hmm. so I'd use those a prior right uh, arguments. The other thing I'll note is this. Eliakim teaches us an important lesson, right? Um, now, uh, I do want to note something that someone just commented. Sivertus asks consensus-based ecclesiology, right? So one way that you can get the unity is if the family leaves together with a universal conclusion, right? The other is if dad has left the elder brother in charge and the elder brother, by an objective claim that nobody else can have from the father, can claim, dad left me in charge and this is my ruling, Right. And then that is also how you can unify the church. Right. Because that would also be a universal ruling with a legitimate authority because he has the authority given to him by dad. Right. And that elder brother is able to settle things on a universal level. So good catch there, Sivertus, uh, uh, to have me clarify that. Now, one of the problems, Pat, that I noticed when I was researching on Eliakim was that mm -hmm. I originally thought that Eliakim didn't have successors. Because in Isaiah 22, 25, the peg that represents Eliakim in some way comes loose. And I thought, oh, well, that means that Eliakim's office ended. And I cited from, or I read from, uh, the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. And this is where I found where I might have gotten this erroneous interpretation from. I might have found it from somewhere else. But here's what it says. A final text describes a peg that will fall and the load, Massah, hanging on it will be cut down. The peg symbolizes Eliakim, a Judahite royal official, and the load slash burden is the glory of his family. Like Shebna before him, Eliakim would eventually fall from power under the weight of the responsibilities that were too much for him, end quote. So notice that this exegete here believes that when the peg comes loose, it means that Eliakim's going to lose his authority. There are no successors. It all comes to an end, right? Or something like that. What was interesting is that Eliakim continued to have successors. He continued to have a royal line. And I want to emphasize here that some people think that um, some people think that uh, you know the office of the chief steward was hereditary, right? Because you know, you see um Eli you know, well, there's various reasons, right? Because one is that Hilkiah is the father or technically the grandfather of Eliakim. And so you see him continuing you know, Hilkiah to Eliakim. So people think, oh, it's biological, it's hereditary. But as Daniel Vecchio pointed out, it's more like a dynasty, like the Clinton dynasty or the Bush dynasty, right? Or the Kennedy dynasty. It's not institutionally built in that it has to be a biological succession as indicated by Shebna, who is not related to Eliakim or um, Hilkiah. 
But the point that I'm making with all of this is that we see in the archaeological record, as noted by Daniel Vecchio, that the successors of Eliakim continued, I should say, um, Eliakim's descendants and cousins and others, they continued, well, I should just say descendants, they continued to have the office of chief steward over the kingdom because Eliakim had built such a name and reputation for himself that the king trusted this family, this bloodline, to sustain his bloodline's legacy, the Davidic temple and kingdom, right? Um, and so if that's the case then, then that doesn't mean that Eliakim acted dishonorably, right? What is noted is that it says in Isaiah 25, uh, 22, 25, in that day, the peg will come loose and all your offspring and all the people who are hanging on it, right? It's Eliakim's legacy that's going to come to an end. Now, in that day, in that day, notes judgment and kind of an apocalyptic scenario. When did Eliakim's successors cease to have the office of chief steward? When the Babylonians in 586 BC took over Jerusalem. And that's when you see Eliakim's successors end, and one of them is instead placed as a governor um, over Israel, but he's no longer a chief steward. My point is this. If we just looked at the text alone of the Bible, we would think, oh, Eliakim has no successors. There's no mention of successors. Um, this seems to be the simplest explanation. And what do we do with Peter? We say, oh, well, Peter didn't have successors because no successors are mentioned. It's the simplest explanation. But notice that that didn't work with Eliakim. We need the archaeology, the historical record, to help us see how to interpret the text. So when we look at the text of the New Testament and we see, you know, it seems like Peter's office is really important. It seems like this rock is a permanent ongoing function. It seems like he's performing a really important duty in the community. It makes sense that it would be successional. And given the typology with Eliakim, as I said before in my previous lecture, it seems to maybe place in potency that you could have successors technically to this office, given that Eliakim's office was successional and Peter receives a chief steward-like office. Well, if that's the case, then let's look at the historical record to help us figure out how to interpret the passage. And what do we see? We see um, from Irenaeus and Hegesippus, within living memory of the apostles, that Peter, had a, that Peter and Paul had Episcopal successors in Rome. We see that within every generation of the Roman church, uh, Hegesippus' list, there were men who were known uh, as bishops who preached orthodoxy, who taught the truth of the faith, right? And then when we look at Clement, and we see that Clement can be dated to before the destruction of the temple, 69 AD, and Peter and Paul were either martyred in 64 to 67 AD, within two to five years, the Roman church was able to organize itself and start commanding another church what to do. There was a sense in which the Roman church understood itself to be responsible for other churches almost immediately after Peter and Paul were, were martyred there. And this early Roman church continually had within you know, its ranks successions of bishops who were known for preaching orthodoxy. And I would argue in particular, right, um, that given... Um, that it, that the, the mana episcopacy originated with Linus. And the reason why I say this is this. You know, when you look at how monarchical institutions rise, like if you look at, you know, psychology, literature, and, and the formation of political societies, it rises up through prestige. Who has a unique status and family or something in the community that distinguishes them, right? If Linus was confirmed by both Peter and Paul to the episcopacy, there would be a unique sense in which he would have a prestige as being the apostle, excuse me, the bishop who had both, you know, apostles to endorse him. Um, and then eventually Clement would succeed to that position right down the line. Uh, you know, there are other things that I can mention too on the succession from Peter. But the point that I want to make is that I think when we, when we look at, okay, there were successors to Peter and Paul in the Roman church in the episcopacy, Almost immediately, the Roman church felt like it was responsible for other churches. It or it, it immediately had a Petrine character, right? A feeling like it was responsible for others. The last thing that we can then, then do is use the biblical data to see it would make sense that you would have a line of chief stewards, of bishops 
who would feel responsible for the other churches because these bishops in the Roman church, maybe something that Peter said to them, whatever, they felt uniquely burdened to take care of the rest of the church almost immediately. I mean, and I mean, you know, um, it's interesting because, you know, it, the, the, the Roman church, it starts acting like it can command other churches like the Jerusalem church. And who was the head of the Jerusalem church before James? Peter. And then presumably who was the head of the Roman church before his martyrdom? Peter. So it's almost like Peter's character left a mark on Jerusalem, but then finally on Rome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, Swan. We covered a lot of territory tonight. So uh, yeah. checked off everything that I had on my list. Any other final summary thoughts? Anything else you've you've learned through this quite immense research project at this point? Writing writing the book, any any you know, it's hard, isn't it? Writing books is hard. It's always yeah. Hard. Writing <laughs> writing books is a lot. Um, I do want to mention one last thing, which is the research that my other colleagues have done and that we've yeah. been working on together. Cool. And I want to acknowledge them because um, you know eventually what I'm hoping is that after I give this presentation will come on the future and they'll present on, on their points. But I do want to note just various typological principles that we also developed for the argument. So I, I gave you the exegesis. I gave you how I would go about making the argument. But then remember in the um, procedure where it says compare your hypothesis against other hypotheses. There we set up different kind of rules for how to compare the different hypotheses, right? So for example, a typological compatibility if properties A and B are compatible in the type, then they cannot be in principle incompatible in the anti-type, right? And so we noted, for example, that Eliakim as chief steward is the highest office under the king such that he can make universal and supreme rulings. But Isaiah can also make, as a prophet, can make supreme and universal rulings, right? But just because Isaiah can also make universal and supreme rulings, that doesn't take away from Eliakim's position as the chief steward. And in fact, you know, Eliakim would have managed the everyday affairs of the kingdom, whereas Isaiah would have kind of inserted himself whenever prophecy was given. Sure. Right. So even the jurisdiction is different. The You could say they both had universal supreme jurisdiction, but then you need to look at the particulars to see what individuates them because you, you don't just then mash them all together. That would be like, once again, Pat, saying that because you and an elephant are animals, you're the same thing. That's not right. Um, typological integrity, right? So any arguments against prime ministerial PET that would also undercut PET should be rejected given PET. So some people in the comments were making the argument that Peter didn't receive anything unique, right? Well, if you grant that there is a Peter Eliakim typology, Peter, for some reason, was uniquely associated with Eliakim in Matthew 16, 19. You can't really make the same association in 1818 because the keys aren't mentioned. The keys are implied insofar as they are implied because Peter has them in 1619, as I believe it was St. Albert the Great who argued that the other disciples have the keys through Peter, right? Even Ulrich Luz, the Protestant New Testament scholar in his book Studies in Matthew, he actually argues that you should read in the reverse direction, that Peter in himself has the entire power of the apostolic college. So regardless, what I'm saying here is that you need to have some type of theory that Peter has some type of primacy and authority. Um, if you just said that there's nothing unique about Peter, then that would actually contradict the fact that he receives uniquely PET. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that when you interpret typology, the main reason why typology is used is it's a hermeneutic of continuity. It was a way in which the apostles and the early church justified the messianic claims of Christ and the church to show that they were in continuity with the Old Testament scriptures. And I believe it was Craig L. Blomberg and others in, in the same book that I cited from before who mentioned this point. Um, let me see here, because they, they do mention how it is um, in continuity. So they say on page 261, at the same time, New Testament writers assumed that God intended that his actions on behalf of Israel would one day find a kind of analogy or fulfillment in Christ and the church. So in other words, that there would be a kind of continuity, but then it would be, of course, a continuity um, of elevation usually. 
In terms of the transfer principle, this is uh, Cameron Bertuzzi's principle. Um, so what we say here is that if a type has some theologically defining property P, then the antitype has P in the absence of defeaters, right? The important thing is theologically defining properties, where we're talking about the unique property contact that I mentioned before um, between the type and the antitype. What's the correspondence? What's the connection? And uh, these properties are such that they distinguish a person within God's plan. And we say that they have them in the absence of defeaters, right? So, for example, if you can show, like, one essential function of Eliakim was that he could command the army if the general was dead. And so, you know, Gavin and others have said, does that mean that the Pope has war powers or that Peter has war powers? You could either say no, because the defeater is Jesus's theology of nonviolence, or you could say yes, but in spiritual warfare, not civil warfare, right? I mean, that's a possibility there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this principle plays an important role in at least getting us forward. And the reason why you should accept the transfer principle is because of the maximal continuity principle, which builds upon T and um, a a H. Mm -hmm. Right, because what we're saying is, is that if we have a New Testament passage that intentionally connects itself to some Old Testament passage, you know, a more complete understanding of N of the New Testament passage depends upon maximal continuity, right? That is to say that, as we mentioned before, maximal continuity, we define that through T, where you have this theologically defining property. And unless there's some defeater and some particular property doesn't continue on into the New Testament, um, if you want to show that the early church was in continuity with the Old Testament, you want to show at least as much as possible, right, that the New, Te like the, 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 uh, the, the New Testament church is in continuity with the Old Testament, right? You want to show that as much as possible. But you also want to acknowledge when that would push you into absurdity, and that would be a limit, that would be a check, um, and when that would be incompatible with the theology of Jesus— if we have right now, you know, the, the Pope acting as a warlord, that would be incompatible. Um, acting as a lord over the gen, uh, over his flock, like the Gentiles were in Matthew's gospel. Yeah. Um, right. So my point is, is that given the that typology is a hermeneutic of continuity and that we have a principle for what properties continue and what properties don't. We we'll want to say that as much as possible. We want to see continuity because that fits the apologetic of the early church the best. That strengthens to the greatest extent possible the claim that they're making, which is the point of typology, to strengthen the continuity. And then we have an elevation principle here, which is that typological continuity generally involves either the identical repetition or the elevation of theologically defining properties within God's plan, right? So for example, when I gave the example of Eliakim having war powers to command the army to be the negotiator with uh, Sennacherib, uh, the Assyrian who was attacking um, in, in the 700s BC, we could elevate that authority from Eliakim and say that Peter has it in a greater way um, because he's under the spiritual kingdom and he is defeating through binding and loosing demons um, and, and, and freeing people and creating a bridge between heaven and earth with his halakhic teachings, making a way for the Gentiles to become part of the community. Or typology might involve identical repetition, as, for example, in the case of uh, Joshua parting um, uh, parting the sea, uh, just as uh, Moses had parted the Red Sea, right? Uh, let's see here. Okay, so that's some of the principles that I have. I know that's a lot to get through, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the work of my colleagues. Yeah, you have a great team there, Swan. I'm, I'm, that's 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 awesome, my friend. So, uh, yeah, good stuff, man. Really good stuff. Really yeah. great to see this conversation continue to develop. Really excited to uh, see where you're gonna this this book once it's once it's finalized. Do we have a um, tentative release date on this by no chance? not yet mm -hmm. not yet okay i'm probably going to finish it by december okay mm -hmm. i do um pat so i do want to hop on to um some comments i i know sure. it might be late for you right now um mm -hmm. i got a I few do... minutes yeah go ahead and highlight a few of them yep. yeah so scott cooper says prime minister is an anachronistic term mm -hmm. in one of my previous lectures i've already addressed this objection it's a term used by scholars to distinguish the chief authority of the chief steward and then the second thing is with the ahistorical nature of this typological claim. So he's claiming that it doesn't have early church attestation. 
do you consider this doctrinal development? And the answer is no, because I think it's in the text itself, and I've given exegetical textual reasons why. The last thing is that Scott Scooper says the papacy did have military power. It ultimately failed. And one could argue that it was incompatible with the papal office to have the authority, uh, uh, that military power, given the theology of Christ of nonviolence. So once again, I can answer all these with theological and biblical arguments. There was uh, most of the, I know you were uh, maybe not being able to keep eye on the chat earlier, Swan, but a lot of it um, was um, around Matthew 18, 18. So I think you you probably mm -hmm. covered a lot of what people were wanting you to cover uh, once we got to that section. But uh, yeah, really good. Final thoughts, Swan? Anything else before we wrap this one up? Yeah, um, you know, I, there there are some other questions that people had, so let me try to get through those really quick. So Declan sure. Sutherland said, was St. Paul the only missionary possible who didn't have a static bishop adjacent jurisdiction? I don't think that's the case because Paul spent a lot of time with the church in Corinth, um, and you see this in the book of Acts, and then he talks about how, you know, when, when Paul says, for example, in his letters, you know, receive this letter, and when I come to you, I'm going to settle some things and sort things out, right? Paul would have acted as a bishop in that local jurisdiction, right? As an overseer, yeah. an administrator. So, I mean, um, so yeah, Paul uh, did have that kind of bishop function. Um, let me see if I have any others. Okay, well, there's a lot of comments here actually, so I don't. Think <laughs> yeah, there are. And sorry, I'm not able. Even though I'm the host, I don't have I don't have the power. We talk about powers today, Swan. I was yeah. I don't get the power to pull comments up, or else I would well, have. I would have done that. The thing right is, now. Pat. The thing is, Pat. Um, even though I call you the host, right? It was a power that I delegated to you, right? right? And so, within this official constitution, I technically have more authority because this is my platform, my channel. I delegated the authority to you, right? But that doesn't deny that you have real authority. That's right. That's right. What a, mm. what a wonderful little tie-in, Swan. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> cool. Any well, any other comments you want to highlight, Swan? Um, I just want to say for all the people who are watching, please keep me in your prayers. Yeah, for sure. As I work on the book, as I uh, kind of work through, you know, the loss of my grandmother. And, um, you know, I, I won't, may, I, may, I might go into more detail later uh, on this, but like a woman that I took care of when I was a Dominican, she passed away. And so that's kind of affecting me. Um, so I've had a lot of grief. I was sick at the beginning of the month. You know, I'm, you know, so th <laughs> this is a weird time to be working on a book, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to get it all done. And so keep me in your prayers. I'm hoping to not be overwhelmed. And for people who are responding, um, for people who are responding to this, um, you know, video or to other videos, I want them to know that I'm probably not going to do a video response or an actual live debate until much later because I want to get a better grip on the book writing process. And also I've noticed that responses tend to tear down friendships. And so what I've been doing is I've been actually arranging private conversations with people who make responses so that we don't, you know, so it's not the case that one person gets dunked on and then everyone's ego is hurt, you know, or something like that. Yeah. I don't want to expose anybody. My goal is to build others up and to build my brothers up. And so, you know, with Gavin, I'm waiting until much later, like after his debate with Trent Horn, because he's already got a lot in his plate. I'm already doing stuff with icons. And also I want to acknowledge that, you know, I didn't um I haven't I didn't watch his most recent typological video. And the reason why was because, you know, that would then poise me to try and respond to it. And then that would poise him to make another response. And so I'm trying to limit, you know, how much I'm taking on right now on my plate, if that makes sense. No, Out of fairness for other people and myself. Yeah. Well, as somebody who's just wrapping up my own book. I very much appreciate the need to sometimes just prioritize, compartmentalize, whatever you want to call it. That's just that's just necessary to do. Swan, you will absolutely be in our prayers. You'll certainly be in mine, my family's. Um, we, I sure I speak for everybody watching. We greatly appreciate the work that you're doing, the care, the grace, and the charity that you bring to these conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. May God bless you and, and God bless everybody that has tuned in. This has been a wonderful episode, Swan. Thank you so much.